and welcome to the HUD OCIO Learning Session. I'm Dr. Melanie Cohen. Today we're going to be discussing the federal dissatisfaction and departure of Generation Y. The federal government is going through a human capital transformation unlike it has ever experienced. The largest generation to date, the baby boomers, are currently retiring and the newest generation, Generation Y, is predicted to be even bigger. Yet Generation Y is quitting the federal government at a rate higher than, any, uh, than all other generations combined. Today we will highlight the critical areas that are causing Generation Y to leave. We're very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Ian Barford of NAVC in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hi, Ian. Hi, good morning. Let me introduce our panel, tell you a little bit about Ian, and then we'll begin our discussion. Today's panel includes Mike Stein from the HUD Office of Employee and Labor Relations, Michael Lawyer from the HUD Office of the Chief Human Capital Officer, and Jeffrey Brown from the Internal Revenue Service. Thank you all for being on our panel today. Dr. Ian Barford has been researching Generation Y within the federal government for over five years. His publication in 2011 was the first to explore Generation Y motivational factors within the federal government. His publication in 2014 was the first empirical study to extend the theory of workplace generational differences into the U.S. federal government domain. He currently works for NAFC as the test and, evaluate, test and evaluation manager for rotating radar, radars in the Program Executive Office of Integrated Warfare Systems and as a systems engineer for the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Virginia Beach. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Ian. Okay, thank you. So before I go into my presentation, I want to talk about um, how I got into this research. So back in the early 2000s, I was hired in um, with a group of people. And over a course of a few months to a few years, some of those people started leaving to the point where it was noticeable within our group. And we started saying, hmm, I wonder why this person is leaving. And, um, you know, just curiosity right there. And so then uh, fast forward maybe a few years, I was at an agency, and they had a slide where it showed the average age of that particular agency. And it was fairly high, enough to um, report out on this. And the person that was presenting said, we need to hire more young people to bring the average age down. As I looked around the room, I saw people nodding their heads as, you know, simple math, you bring in younger people, it brings the age down. However, I started thinking, well, in my small circle, um, people were leaving. I wonder if this agency would have the same, uh, would it, the same effect would have in the same agency where young people would be hired in and then they would eventually leave. So it was just more of a questioning type of thing. And then I started doing some cursory research online, looking at some articles and trying to see, are young people really leaving? And then I kind of stumbled upon this uh, theory of generational differences. And it was in its infancy then, and some articles were written um, within the private sector talking about how um, empirical studies have been done where the people from different generations have different workplace uh, attitudes, therefore uh, they act differently at work. And so uh, reading these articles, I, I noticed that there was nothing written within the federal government domain. And I started thinking, you know, I, I wonder if this small subset of people that I'm uh, witnessing leaving is happening across the entire federal government. And so from that point on, I decided to, to um, do this research in that particular area. And so that started in 2009, and, and I'm here today to present the results, and I hope hopefully you guys find it interesting. And um, so now let's go to the slides. I'd like to start at um, slide two. And, and talk a little bit about these uh, data sets that I use. Um, so on slide two, there's two data sets. Um, one is the OPM FEDSCO data set. This is basically current and former uh, HR data on federal employees. So this was the first um, data set that I used to see, hey, are people in the government leaving? And this just shows um, what has happened over the last few years, actually over the last decade or so, of uh, people entering the government, leaving the government, and then by age. So I just kind of it was basically what's happening. And then the next data set that I used was uh, the OPM survey, and that's the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey that I'm sure most of you are aware of. And I analyzed that data set to see, um, uh, to see why are they leaving. And um, so then let's go to the next slide. I want to show just, uh, just two graphics. The next slide is slide three. So you see here separation trends and quitting trends. And so the top graphic, I'll try to explain this because you're going to see this graphic um, a few more times in this presentation. 
So separation trends. What this is is if you look at the x-axis, it's the number, it's the years. So you see 2005 through 2014, and then the y-axis shows the percentages. And all I've done is um, I took the number of people who separated from the federal government, and I just um, I, I stratified by generation. So I basically took Generation Y or the Millennials, formed between 1980 to 1995, Generation X. 1965 to about 1979, and then Baby Boomers, 1946 to 1964. And then I applauded them over time to see if, in fact, Generation Y is leading within the federal government. And one important note in this, in this first graphic, separation trend, um, people separating, it could just be people leaving their agency, going to a different agency within the government. Um, they could be quitting, retiring, reduction in force. They could be removed or they could, um, or um, something, something else. And so when I plotted these uh, three generations, I see now, – now, basically, I'm looking for positive or negative trend lines. I'm not trying to predict future happenings and percentages, so I just want to make that clear. And so I, in the first graphic, the top one, I see that the baby boomers, the dotted line, they're leaving over time. There's a, there's a positive trend line, and that can be attributed to them retiring. So we all know that. And then Generation X in the middle of the two lines, that is a negative trend line. They're living less over time, separating less over time. The Generation Y came out pretty interesting. Um, this line, this is a trend line based on the on the fit of the data. So, um, um, just wanted to make that clear. It, this is not um, an actual line. This is uh, the best fit of the data, the linear trend line. Generation Y in the red has a positive uh, separating trend line. That was very interesting. So I delved deeper into the separation trends, and I said, I want to just find out who's quitting, purely who's quitting, and that's the chart below. Um, same axis labels, and you see baby boomers and Generation X both have a negative quitting trend line. So of all the people that are quitting the federal government, Generation Y has a positive quitting trend line, which means they're quitting more over time. And I'll go ahead and stop there, and we can take some questions and discuss this. Okay. Well, you know, so let me, let me start. So I just want to make sure people understand what quitting means. So quitting is about just leaving the public sector and then moving either to private, nonprofit, you know, um, think tanks, whatever they're going to, right? Correct. Okay. So let, let's think about, I mean, why, why is that really happening? I mean, what, what, what do you think, what have you come to so far that's really kind of causing that? Well, the rest of the presentation will show that um, analyzing the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey's um, index levels I found that one index level jumped out um, to be the most prominent, and I believe that outweighs the other index level. So let's go to the next. Let's go to the next slide because I think that's the one that kind of helps lay some of the stuff out. Okay. So slide four. Now uh, this is a busy chart, so I'll try to explain it. There are six index levels from leadership and knowledge management all the way down to employee gates. These are established by OPM, and they do a great job of, of taking survey questions and grouping them into these into these index levels. And so what I've done is I've taken these index levels and analyzed them, as you see the arrow from 2006 all the way through 2013, and I, I, uh, I cut each of these index levels by generation. So I analyzed, let's just, for example, leadership and knowledge management. I compared Gen X to Gen Y to baby boomers to see if there are any differences and did some statistics. And then I did that for 2006, and I repeated again all the way through the years of 2013 to just find on the bottom right side bubble, are there really different? And so we go to slide five. Here's the answer. Yes, there are differences. And um, we'll go to slide six, and I'll show you um, what some of the results were. So this slide on slide six, shows Generation Y index ranking. And what this, what this says is that over all the years, Generation Y ranked five of the six indices the highest compared to all of the other generations. And they, and they ranked job satisfaction the lowest out of all other indices and lower than other generations. And so um, the conclusion that I've come to is that if you look on slide seven, Is slide, oh, I'm sorry, slide seven is another chart. Um, let, let me tell you about this as well. Um, 
So this is one particular question with, within these surveys that says, are you planning on leaving the government? In the top slide, the top, um, the top graphic says, yes, I'm planning to stay within the government. And as you can see, Generation Y is, has a positive line, which means, um, yes, I'm planning on leaving, but I want to stay in the government. And so the baby boomers also has a, a positive, or the Generation X has a positive line as well, saying, I plan on leaving, but I want to stay within the government. So those trend lines, even though they're positive, they're really negative because it says over time they're leaving more. And then if you look at the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, graphic, this says, yes, I plan on leaving within the next year, but to leave the government in, entirely. And the thing that this, I, I don't want people to jump to too many conclusions here, but you're comparing generations. And so two of the three generations have a negative line, which means, yes, um, I don't plan on leaving the government in the next year, but Generation Y says, yes, I plan on leaving the government. They have a positive line. That's really what this shows. This is one survey question, uh, one, um, one question within all the surveys within all the years, as you can see the x-axis, 2006 to 2013. And so finally, um, to kind of wrap this all together on slide eight, here is um, what I've come up with. On slide eight, you have FedScope uh, quitting separation trend lines increasing. You have um, the one question within the survey saying, I'm planning on leaving over the years. And then you have the actual analysis of the survey saying that job satisfaction is ranked the lowest out of all other indices. And I think that job satisfaction index is weighted more heavily than Generation Y than the other five indices combined. So these two independent data sources corroborate the same phenomena that I saw here locally and did the research um, basically globally within the federal government, and it un unveils that job satisfaction outweighs everything. And I think that this is causing the exodus. So, you know, I think this might be a good time to begin some discussion here, because I see, uh, you know, there's, it, it's very, it's fascinating, because job satisfaction, when I think about job satisfaction and, and engagement, those are two separate things. Mm -hmm. So satisfaction is really more about fulfilling expectations, right? right? So is this job really fulfilling is this fulfilling the expectations you expect when you go into the public sector? Um, engagement is really more about having an emotional commitment to your organization, the people around you. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the, so what I'm gathering now from, from the, uh, the results is from what you see, it's not really that there's not an emotional commitment to the work because I think that Generation Y is very committed to doing to social issues and doing really important work. It's really about the conditions that we see in the, the sa satisfaction is really more about the conditions that we see in the public sector. So I'm going to let Ian first, you know, kind of comment on my comment and then let's open it up to the rest of uh, the panel and we'll talk about that. Yeah, I would agree 100%. If you look at the questions that comprise each of these indices, the job satisfaction index kind of has an intrinsic feel. How do I feel about my job? Um, do I get satisfaction out of it? Things like that. The other indices are more like, how is my manager? How is how is uh, um, how are the results conveyed to me? Things like that. And the employee engagement index also has a bit of the intrinsic feel, but it's mostly comprised of stuff that um, that has to do with um, the job and the surroundings and things like that. So it really has to do with how they feel about their jobs, and how, um, I guess, their agency makes them feel about their jobs. Communi Communication-wise, I would say, is, is the, biggest, um, the biggest thing within that job satisfaction index. Okay. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to jump on that, because the, the satisfaction indices in the EVS tend to start with questions that open with, considering everything, right. uh, whereas the other indexes tend to be a little bit more tactical. And I worked with a lot of our new employees here at HUD for a number of years. And one of the things that we found really challenging was actually meeting their social needs. Uh, and that what we had were some incredibly talented, incredibly bright employees who had just left school, moved across the country, were now in a strange city with no friends, no family, and were frequently the first person uh, hired into their work group in a long time. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have anybody to go to lunch with. Uh, and while the office was great you know, and took them out for the new employee lunch and did all the things that they thought were nice, uh, they all wanted to talk about you know, how their kids were doing and getting into good schools and paying for college. And you have a group of 25 and 26-year-olds who just aren't worried about those things and are trying to figure out how to establish their own professional lives. And it was really challenging to get them a peer group that could help them through that transition. 
because part of their, their social dynamics was what was making a lot of the question about whether they stayed or left. And what we saw was the employees who plugged into a community of their peers were a lot more likely to stay. Now, we don't have data on that, because obviously we don't track who's friends with who, uh, and who's been going to lunch with who, that would be wrong. Um, but trying to, to figure out, uh, and, and I'd be really curious as to your opinion, how much of that is captured in the considering everything, how satisfied are you, as opposed to my manager graded me fairly and I've got interesting work to do? No, that, that's a great observation. And I, I can't really say specifically why those questions are in there. I, I know that OPM does a great job of crafting those questions. They have a great statistical team behind that. So um, there are reasons for these questions. Um, but I will say, as far as the data, there, there, are, there are data um, in publications in private industry which talk about companies who have done the things that you're talking about um, that have made it a little more socially cautious and that their, um, their turnover rate has decreased because of these efforts, and they have empirical data that supports that. And so bringing some of those um, ideas into the government, we have kind of four concrete walls that really can't be moved, maybe pushed a little bit. So some of these things we can't do. So we have to come up with other innovative ways to create this atmosphere for which other private industries have done this. Okay, Mike? Uh, job satisfaction is a very interesting uh, principle. There is a great debate in the um, um, generation diversity community between age cohort and generation cohort. The generation people say every generation has its own personality. The age cohort people would say 20-year-olds act the same in every generation. So that a 20-year-old back in 1940 would have a similar personality to a 20-year work personality, to a 20-year-old in 1960, to a 20-year-old in 1980, to one today. Uh, but job satisfaction um, changes with age, in a sense, because when I look back in my family, my father had very low job satisfaction. Yet he stuck with his company for many, many years. Um, and I'm not sure what he would have done if he was in the federal government in the same kind of generation back in 1940 or 1960. Um, but today, I think, because I, I fall into the generational that each has a personality. So job satisfaction is very important to people, granted. And there's a lot more opportunity for people um, to pick up and move. If they're not satisfied with the job, you carry your, your, your um, your background, your, your knowledge, skills, and abilities with you. And you can translate that into the private sector, into public interest, translate that back into the federal government at some point if you want. So I, I agree with you. Job satisfaction is critically important. I've spoken to a lot of um, uh, Gen Y people here who, you know, and across the federal government who are not satisfied. So what you have to then drill down to is why are you not satisfied? What can, how can the federal government change to make you satisfied? And if enough Gen Y stick with the federal government and change the federal government, then I think their job satisfaction would increase. Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything you said. The, the age uh, period um, theory is, is one that contradicts the generational theory. And longitudinal analyses really are the, are the things that would help um, uh, flesh those out. But when you have these longitudinal analyses, you, you, you have data from 20, 30 years ago, and you can't, it's hard to compare working on computers now to there were no computers then to see if baby boomers acted the same when they were younger as, as Generation Y does. Um, so that's really the problem practitioners are having now is trying to establish um, a methodology for which to um, compare those two to actually say that um, one of these theories is better than the other. So um, you have these competing theories. And so what practitioners do is they keep trying to um, stick with what they know and trying to uh, do different methodologies to prove or disprove each theory. And what we've reached right now is there's no conclusive evidence, but there's some really good work going on. And it, it's started to explode in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so we're on the cusp of something cutting edge, and I can, I can feel it coming. And within the federal government as well, hopefully this propels people to start thinking about this and maybe some more um, analyses could be done based on this particular uh, data set that the um, OPM is providing to us because it's, it's gold and it's still good. Uh, 
Ian, as you suggested, the, and as Mike suggested, you know, job satisfaction is a little bit uh, vague and, and mushy, and some of those other things on the left-hand side of your fulcrum are pretty concrete and specific. You mentioned communication as one factor that at least you thought might be a part of that job satisfaction or, or something that could, be, that could have an effect on that. Um, we were talking before the program about the onboarding programs at various agencies and the differences, the, the wide variation of experience that, um, that new employees have when they come onto a place and, and whether they're able to identify with the mission of the organization or whether that's communicated to them to use, to use your word. And I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts on that or other ideas of the pieces that might uh, either you know, come into mind when people rate that question or things that we might have an effect on uh, that, that you know, w would tip that scale a little bit? Yeah, I think there's some things that we can do that don't cost, that doesn't cost any money that can really help an agency see some um, people start saying. Um, communication is, a, is the number one thing that I would say. The research that I've seen um, in the public sector, in the private sector, they talk about um, over-communicating with Generation Y. So they found that communicating with them and over-communicating and, and the bosses and, and the employees are on the same page and they're communicating many times a day, and not only just communicating via email, they could be doing texting or, or whatever the means are to get the point across, and it doesn't have to be all work-related. They found that um, those who have higher levels of communication actually um, – the younger generation actually prefers that and actually stays, and they stay longer. And they've done they've done some more research where the people actually stay longer than they're supposed to for being that young, because they're supposed to change jobs many many times within their 20s. Um, if they're very very satisfied with the communication they're getting from their 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 peers, their mentors, and um, and, the, and the people above them, they're going to stay longer. And that that has started to surface as one of the things that the government could potentially do. I have a question about your research. Um, have you cut it a little bit more fine? Um, you know, there's best places to work in the federal government. Um, the Partnership for Public Service puts out all of their rankings and ratings. Have you found that there's a less bleed of um, uh, Gen Y from the, you know, best places to work straight down through the not so best places to work? That fewer Gen Ys are leaving, you know, the top agencies on that list versus the other agencies. Have you done research there? Okay, so you and I did not discuss this question beforehand, but no. I have this in my, in my, um, in my uh, presentation here, and I'll talk about, and not um, the best places to work, but um, OPM put out their newest, uh, based on the 2015 results, the highest ranking agencies, um, the, the employee engagement index and things like that. And I'm gonna show you um, the, I slice the data a little bit, for each of those agencies, the top agencies, mm -hmm. the lower agencies, and in the middle as well of big and small agencies. And I want to show you the, the trend lines for each of those and actually play a little game to see if you guys can guess uh, which are agencies are top or the bottom agencies. <laughs> by uh -huh. So, we'll, so I, I mean, I could ask a, a dozen other questions, but we'll, uh, we'll let you continue on with the presentation, and then that will spur other ideas. Okay, very good. Let's go to slide nine. So that was a perfect segue. So here is a challenge we're going to do. So I'm going to show you two graphs. You guys have seen them before. They're um, quitting trend lines, not separation. They're quitting, okay? And so um, one graphic you're going to see is a large agency who scored um, high in the 2015 Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. And I'll also say, I don't want to, I'm not going to give away what agencies they are, but these agencies also have scored high in the past uh, FEVS as well, so it's not just a one-time thing. And then I'm going to show you another graphic. It's a large agency who scored low in the survey um, for 2015, and these agencies are kind of habitually low as well for whatever reason. It's not good or bad. This is just information. And so the challenge I want to ask um, the panel and then the people who are watching um, is just, in your mind, pick the highest scoring agency. Pick the agency you think has uh, the best retention rate, and we'll play a game. And there's going to be three charts I'm going to show you, or three slides. Let's go to slide 10. So you see two graphics here. Um, the red is obviously Generation Y. I'm going to keep it the same throughout. 
And then um, the years are 2005, 2014. So it's a lot of data. And uh, these lines are the best fit trend lines, linear trend lines. So pick A or B in your mind of what agency you think is um, the highest agency. And then obviously B will be the lowest. I'll give you guys a few seconds there. Okay. So let's go to the next slide, slide 11. There's two more graphics. Okay, and let's go to slide 12. This is the last one. Okay, they're, they're pretty similar. All are pretty similar. So I'll stop here and uh, ask the panel, just uh, three letters, what do you think? What are the highest scoring agencies? I let you know. I mean, I, I've in my sense, we haven't huddled here, so. Um, but I would think probably the highest scoring agency is the one that's losing the least Generation Y. So I would think probably B. But I don't know what the other people think. I'm, I'm just just for dramatic interest. Right. right. Uh, I'm going to be <laughs> contrarian on this one. And I'm suggesting about what you said earlier that some of the things we're measuring don't play the same in each generation and that it's the reverse and that agencies that are scoring well are very well adapted but very well adapted for one culture and that might be pushing people out uh, who don't fit that culture. So I'm going to go B. I went B. I mean A. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, what did the other, other two, what do you think? Do you have a sense? Uh, I don't know. I think that you, I think the your interpretation, Melanie, is kind of the logical one, right? The right. expected one. And so uh, right, right. that suggests, given that we're playing the game, that uh, we work a little reverse psychology oh, that yeah. Ian's trying okay. to trick us. But, right. uh, and I'm, I'm just I would never at, trick you guys. <laughs> and I'm just looking at the, at the raw data, like where the, the lines start and end from mm -hmm. 10 to 30 percent for the, the Gen Y, from 10 to, to 30 percent. You know, so I'm looking at B as, as, as less of a difference for, um, for I, I would say B is the better agency because cause the, the differences aren't as great mm -hmm. in, in, in the okay. losses. That's good logic. And so on all three graphics, um, B had the less, uh, it had the, um, um, the trend line wasn't as pronounced, right? So it wasn't as, as steep. And so uh, Melanie's logic would, would be that uh, the less steep the trend line, um, the better the agency. And then Michael Lawyer talked about um, the reverse psychology, how uh, they're probably well adapted to the older generation. So if you move on to slide 12, the answer is A for all of them. And so it's kind of what Michael was talking about. Um, even, even, the, even the highest scoring agencies um, seem to have a problem. Now, I use the word seem because this is not conclusive. I just want to make that clear. I don't want to be jumping down my throat to say, oh, you said this. I'm not predicting anything. But it shows that all these high-scoring agencies are susceptible uh, to this phenomenon that's happening right now. And so that's, uh, that, so that's the takeaway from the slide. So, so even the highest-scoring agencies, theoretically the highest-scoring are the best places to work, perhaps, right? So even the highest-scoring agencies are losing millennials at, the greatest, at, 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 a, at a great uh, uh, rate. So... That's alarming. I think that that's alarming because what that means is not only are the poor scoring agencies losing millennials, but the high scoring agencies are also losing millennials at a high rate. So the question then is, where do we go from here? Well, What's it's more alarming than that yeah. because, uh, sorry to cut you off, <laughs> <somebody. laughs> um, but because what it says is we're measuring the wrong things. If what we're saying is somebody who's doing well on all of these things that we're measuring is losing the next generation of civil servants. And when we look at all of the indexes back on slide four or five, where the only one where we're negative on is the one where they say, hard data aside, how do you really feel? That means that the hard data is not measuring the right things and that we're managing to the wrong tactics to deliver the outcome that we're going for. But and more than that, it's, it's what the delta is. If you're a high scoring agency, how did you get there? Mm -hmm. If you've got low job satisfaction for your Gen Y, it means your Gen X and boomers have a higher job satisfaction, higher results in the other indices. What are we doing wrong? I mean, what, where is the delta? Why are Gen Y 
not feeling the same job satisfaction as X and boomers in the high scoring agencies. And if we could determine that, you could cascade that to the whole government. Right, right. I, 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 exactly. And, I and but, but I also think too, it's, it's. So Generation Y is coming into mm -hmm. the government because of the commitment to the work, right? Mm -hmm. It's something about the environment that they're in that's creating the issue. Would you really, like a which list? is the satisfaction <laughs> issue. Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Would you like a list of the things <laughs> yeah. about the environment that are creating the issue? Well, I think we kind of know the list. I mean, it, it's just that we need to work on that list. Mm -hmm. I think what we see now across the government is there's not enough work going on on that list to actually make the change because the job satisfaction rate is the prevailing area of dissatisfaction. Well, and part of what we have to remember, too, is that this is really tied to mission success for our agencies. This isn't just right. about taking care of the kids uh, and making sure everybody gets a trophy. Because for starters, the kids now goes up to 35. Right. And these are young families and young professionals. Right. Uh, and that this is our clients and American citizens. Uh, millennials are now the largest generation in the population. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying, if we have a government that they have a hard time working in, that may mean we have a government that has a hard time serving them and a hard time understanding what their real needs are. If we can't meet their needs as employers, how do we meet their needs as the government? Right, and we need to get a good handle on this because in three years or less, the next generation will really actively be in the workforce, mm -hmm. you know, because then they'll be eligible to be into the military. Mm -hmm. So you really have this new other generation that's going to be coming in. And until we can sort of understand what we're not, what we need to do better here, uh, we're really going to be at a loss, I think, going forward for the next generation. And, and this could get worse rather than better, because I've been speaking to a lot of boomers who are retiring early mm -hmm. because of low job satisfaction. Right. So if the boomers retire and the Gen Y are leaving in greater numbers, there's succession planning issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the fewer boomers you have who retire early can't then translate that knowledge to why right. across the generational spectrum, and then why will have lower satisfaction and leave at a quicker rate. So there, there's a real problem that goes in, in on both ends. Right, Absolutely. and then the other piece that you mentioned and that for me in uh, research is that when you look at Gen X, it's pretty steady. You know, they're not really going anywhere. It's a smaller group of people because it's only a 14 year span, but there, there's no real change going on there. So you're gonna be left with sort of this group in the center and, um, and I don't know how much research or discussion or care is going to that group. So there's another way we've cut the data that's helped look at some of that, which is if you cut it by tenure with the agency or with the federal government mm -hmm. as opposed to by age. And they, they correlate, but only loosely. Um, what we see is, is for every, and this is off the public FedScope data, so this is federal government wide, mm -hmm. um, off of, for every two employees that separates from civil service with more than 20 years of service, so that's your retiree population we lose three employees with less than five years of service, which is some of the, many of those are Y, some of those are Xers coming in. Mm -hmm. But to your point about Xers staying kind of flat, many Xers correlate with that, well, we've been here about 10 years now, they're in mid-career, um, they're not exactly golden handcuffs, but the uh, tin handcuffs the, uh, <laughs> have, have kicked in, they've right. got a steady career, they're busy dealing with family, they're not necessarily at the, you know, that's where the, the stage of life phase comes in, mm -hmm. um, that they are in a more stable place. But I don't think we can count on them being here for forever either, uh, that when their stage of life changes, we may see a very big change in behavior there that we're not prepared for. Mm -hmm. Right. And the other thing that you and I have spoken about, Ian, and we talked, I, I'm not sure if we talked about it in the panel or not in advance, but one of the things is I think with the millennials, they, they can come in, I'm not sure what the years of tenure are. They may be coming in, staying for three years uh, because it's easier to come back in, go out, try new careers, new industries, new sectors, seeing what that's all about, and then coming back. We don't have any information on who comes back. And so we're not really, we're not capturing that and we probably can't, I don't know how we would. But um, it's something to think about a little bit. I don't know if you're thinking about it at all, Ian. I mean, I'm thinking about it a little bit but um, thinking about in terms of research, 
But it's something for us to kind of consider. You know, who comes back into the government? Who's coming into the government? And that's going to be sort of longitudinal. In several years, we need to look at that and see what generation those people are part of to see if the, if the Gen Ys are coming back into the government. Well, having You know, unfortunately, with all these data breaches happening, um, when personal identifiable information are being compromised, um, identifying who has come in, who has left, I'm not sure that data is being captured, nor do I think that people want that data to be captured. <laughs> if, it, if it is captured, it would be great, but, right. um, yeah. Well, Just okay, for us, I, it's more area of research to talk about. I, I, have <laughs> separate, I have separated from the federal government and have come back, so I'm one of those people, mm -hmm. even though I'm not a, uh, a Gen Y. Um, but OPM is trying to make it easier because you know you have CSRS mm -hmm. and now FERS. FERS is more portable. It's a slow process, but so so your your annual leave banks, your sick leave banks can get transferred back to you when you come back mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. service. I'm sure OPM is looking at some other things to make it easier to transition out and transition back because that's really the wave of the future. It's it's people who have tried government. They go, maybe go to public interest after that, or they go to a think tank, and then say, okay, I'm coming back into federal service. I may leave again. And it's that back and forth mm -hmm. of separation and then, and then re reinstatements. So, so we got into this a little bit in, in the um, break room beforehand, and I still don't agree with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And, and one of the things <laughs> that I've seen with a lot of the new employees who we saw come in is that public service is their plan A and they want to be here for a long time. What they don't want is to be at the same desk mm -hmm. for a long time doing mm -hmm. the same work. And that this in and out of public service, they're not opposed to it, but that's plan B. If we could give them the opportunity to try new roles, to keep their growth curve steep, to do uh, new and interesting work when they've mastered the work that's in front of them, we would keep them a lot longer. And we wouldn't have as much of the in and the out. We would have agency to agency. Right. We'd have people from HUD going over to transportation, right. going over to HHS, but that's good movement for the government. Absolutely. That's a positive for us. And, and OPM, yeah, I agree. OPM is looking I, I would at that. Say one of the oh, things sorry. that we do now, we have these big milestones in like the GS pay scale or whatever. You have to wait a year. Um, one of the things that's been offered is take these milestones, break them apart, and, and make them into inch stones. So it seems like um, there are things that they're reaching these levels quicker and their satisfaction increases as they reach these levels where it's not just this giant mountain they overcome and they've been in a job for five years. Finally, that particular thing they've worked on is, is implemented. Well, inch stones along the way communicated by their managers mm -hmm. um, is a great step in that direction. And OPM, that. I'm sorry, OPM, <laughs> is, to cut me OPM is looking into that. Sorry about that. <laughs> OPM is looking into that by creating pools. They're talking about making pools now so that um, all the 201 series, the 905 series, the 500 series will be in a pool. So make it easier to be able to transition between agencies. If you're interested and you're a 201 at HUD, then you could take your 201 KSAs and then move to the Department of Interior or the Department of Energy, making it easier to transition between agencies. There are, I, there are a couple of ways I think that, that people can be challenged and engaged in their work, right? It, one way in which we can't compete with the private sector is I see a different, well, in many cases, here's a big picture, different way we could sort of revolutionize what we're doing and turn things over and go a whole different direction. And, you know, the government, for, for many good reasons, is designed not to be lithe and agile on, on things like that. Things move slowly and change slowly. And so if, if we're just talking about, I'm going to be this, you know, this catalyst that goes in and blows up the whole system, mm -hmm. then we're not going to compete probably with a private sector job. But I think as, as you guys are suggesting, there are other ways that people can be challenged, and that is by dealing with new problems and looking at things uh, that they, they've got some experience in now, and I can move over to another area and apply that experience and look at a new problem and provide some insight mm -hmm. to the people working mm -hmm. at this other place. And so I, I would agree. I think it's key that for, for mm -hmm. new employees, especially who may, as, as you said, with, with inch stones, may need some, some more frequent and uh, more frequent feedback and, and more frequent accomplishment, mm -hmm. that that's a way we can get it to them. We're not going to get it to them in the process of kind of <laughs> moving along and you know, slowly up the career ladder 
uh, doing the same things that the organization has always done, that's just not going to do it for them. Well, I think that ties into something that you said earlier about feedback and communication and that employees who are getting over-communicated feedback are staying longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, switching jobs is the ultimate feedback. I like you so much and your performance so much, I'm going to give you a new job. That's, that's some validation. Um, but finding ways to do that without making people go get a new job and a lot of the ways that we provide feedback in the federal government do not match up with people's expectations for this stuff. Well, we're all in the uh, performance management system right now. It's October. So, you know, we're all putting our, you know, our ratings together. It, it becomes a once a year thing or a mid year. It's a twice a year thing in the federal sector. And, and it, it, it's not a good thing. Um, it's not a good thing for boomers either. It's, it's not just <laughs> the Gen Xers and the Gen Ys. Everybody wants that, that performance input. And, it sh and I always say it should be on a daily basis, but it, it, it's really hard. I think it's, it's harder, actually, on the Gen Y because, you know, culturally, you, you need that kind of input more. Um, and if that's a generational thing, I think, uh, where somebody who has been in the government for 20, 25 years in this system of twice a year, it's an evaluation, it doesn't really matter except at awards time, they, it, it, it doesn't have the same meaning, and it has to change. It, that performance management system across the government has to change. Well, and this is one of those things that I think comes back to the stage of life theory versus the generation theory, uh, is that you have to remember, too, with millennials that these are people who are still making their career. Their growth curve is still super high, and that's what they're really trying to do. When you're evaluating somebody who's at the end of their career, yeah, of course I did a good job. I know I did a good job. I did a good job for the last 10 years. Why is this year different? Um, when you're talking to somebody who doesn't have that track record and doesn't have that self-confidence. Because, um, you know, we talk a lot about, oh, the bluster they come in with and they all think they could be deputy assistant secretary after six months. And, you know, you talk to them, and that's an act. That's a, that's a lack of confidence thing, and they're covering up with a little bit of bluster, like any of us do when we have those moments. They're new at this. They don't know how they're doing. They think they're good. They got told they were good in grad school. They got told they were good in undergrad. But they don't know if that translates. And if we wait until once a year to give them feedback in this incredibly high pressure situation, because to them it feels very high pressure, they can't hear or learn from it because it's a defensive encounter. We've got to be giving them those, those inch stones every week and every day to help keep their growth curve high. Well, and let, it goes back to, Ian, oh, I'm going to let you continue. Things? I'm going to let you continue, but it goes back to what you were talking about with the communication. Yeah. So, so two things. This is a risk versus reward, right? What is, what is the risk of communicating more? It's really low. What's the reward? It is so high. The reward is so high. So um, you have an audience out there, correct, Melanie, yes. in front of you? <laughs> okay. Can I have... Everybody who's in Gen Y, raise their hand. Is a lot, are there a lot of people out there? Oh, I'm sorry. No, yeah. we, we're, no, no. We have an audience oh, on the don't. Internet of hundreds oh. of thousands of people watching, but <laughs> Everyone no. on the Internet, click the button <laughs> if you're yeah, in Gen Y. Yeah. Raise yeah. your hand if on you're in Gen Y. On the Internet, <laughs> raise your hand. So I've, I've talked about this. Um, I, I've discussed this four times in an open forum like this and then and many other times in smaller groups. I've had a 100% response rate to this question. This goes into um, communication, right? So. What I tell, what I ask the younger generation to raise their hands and say, listen, you guys are making the least amount of money out of anybody in this room. And I kind of get some chuckles. And I want the older generation, the boomers and Gen X, to see this as well. And so I say to Gen Y, I say, okay, you're making the least amount, um, theoretically. Some of you may be making more, but whatever. The majority are making less. I'm going to take 10% of your salary away. Just give it to me. And in return, I'm going to give you 10% of your time. So of the 40 hours a week that you work, I'm going to give you four hours to work on Anything that you feel right. um, could benefit your command, but you have to have supervisor approval, 100% mm -hmm. response rate over the years that they would do that. And I'm taking away their money. So, I mean, th this goes into um, yeah, uh, challenging them, commu communicating with them, and then, and then, and then their innovative ideas, they, they want to be innovative. And so um, I thought that was pretty interesting. We actually piloted that. Uh, mm -hmm. Here at HUD a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, we did a pilot of that called Innovation Time. We didn't actually take away their money. We, <laughs> they, we let them keep that. Uh, but what we said is just, we'll, we won't take away any of your duties. You'll still have the same workload, 
but we'll give you 10% of your time and permission to get together with a team and work on whatever you want. And the only thing that we will promise you is four months from now, if you've got a good idea, you can pitch it to the deputy secretary. And we saw amazing energy and productivity out of that. But we also did pre and post testing using EVS questions. And we saw 10 point spikes on a couple of key EVS questions about that, just for giving people the opportunity to work on the things that they cared about and get direct feedback on those ideas. So here is a, a, a serious problem. And it's a problem of patience. The workforce reflects the generation. So when the, the boomers were in charge, are in charge, were in charge, uh, the workforce <laughs> looks like the, what's comfortable to a boomer. Mm -hmm. OK, so now move that into Gen X. And you've, you've got uh, dress down Fridays. You've got a more relaxed kind of atmosphere. And this is a point I was making at the negotiating table, because uh, I do a lot of contracts negotiation. We're talking about telework. Now, Gen Y, telework is critically important. It's important to volunteer. It's important to trade maybe money for time. Um, but if the Gen Ys would just have the patience to take over the workforce in five, six, seven years and make that <laughs> workforce look like them because they will be the workforce and be more comfortable, it will look very different than it is today. Tell, for example, I think tell if you one. communicate that to them, they'd be, they'd be um, willing to do that. Nope. <laughs> I want to hear why no. Who's going to wait five years? There are so many other things I can accomplish in five years. Why would I? Why, why would I let the American people sit and wait five years for us to start delivering better? Well, here we go on the patience thing. So, <laughs> so my dad had a lot of patience in in his generation, and that so you're looking at a kind of like a, a patience uh, deficiency kind of thing. You, it takes time to change a. Excess. It takes time to change a workforce. It takes time to change the culture in a workforce. If the workforce reflects the generation, you have to have enough of a generation to make that cultural change, like the Y, that like the X's did for making the so, workforce comfortable for an X so, or for a boomer or for a Y in a few years. The well, workforce what? reflects the generation. But it should, what it should reflect is the society that it is working on behalf of. And it's not a boomer society anymore. It's a millennial society. Boomers are no longer the largest generation and no longer run the world. But the me generation still thinks it does. So I know. OK, and well, we can, we, can, or we can talk about this for quite a while. But I would still like to let uh, Ian finish his presentation, at least. At least get to the rest of your slides. Okay, okay, great. Um, I have, uh, just a few more slides up. So let's go to slide 14. This is a very busy slide. Um, I plotted um, not only the largest agencies, uh, the largest top agencies, the largest lowest agencies, and I plotted the largest small agencies in the, in the um, I'm sorry, the highest small agencies and the lowest small agencies and some agencies in the middle. All of their separation, including trend lines, purely for Generation Y. And as you can see here, all but one has a positive slope. Do you know which one has, is able to retain and why they're able one, to retain? If you look at the one on the top, the separation one, that starts at 20% mm -hmm. and decreases to like, or starts at 21 and decreases to 20, I know which agency that is, but that's not a good number either. Yeah. You have been steadily losing people over time. I don't consider that a win at all. But but that's but it's a but it's so, a less bleed. So they they may be doing something that could shift this graph into not so bad. If you uh, understand. Potentially. It. But but that separation and then there that trend line for separation down in the quitting trend line um, is actually one of the highest and it's leveled off right there at fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So um, it's still pretty bad. But you are right. I, I still think these are just. These aren't, um, these aren't in stone. I still think looking at the agencies that are the highest agencies and understanding what kind of stuff they do is critical to all agencies in the federal government to understand what are they doing um, differently. And maybe they could adopt these things like, like Michael was talking about. Now, Michael, let me ask you, that 10% back thing, was that after my presentation in 2011 here at HUD? Yes, it was, it was not too long after that. Um, and while I can okay. neither confirm nor deny that you should get all of the credit for that, <laughs> I'm glad you were there. <laughs> 
Right, so the residual check can be sent. Melanie has my address. <laughs> right, 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 no. <laughs> oh, oh, so, okay, so next. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was, gonna, I was just going to say I'm trying to break up some fights here. So go ahead and continue <laughs> never, on with your never. slides. So slide 15. So we have two more slides. And slide 15, just talk about what your agencies do. And we've, we've discussed these a little bit, but I basically want to just kind of say, hey, um, please don't ignore these trends and then, and then pump the brakes a little bit. Don't overreact. Don't change policy immediately. I don't think any agency will do that, but that's okay. I just wanted to put that in there. Um, begin communicating with your agency. Begin, begin communicating with the millennials about these results. Say, listen, we've seen this presentation. We've seen these surveys. Um, are you truly dissatisfied? And you are. Let's talk about this. And then finally, the fourth bullet, let's talk about these job satisfaction questions and just you know, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, a small group setting, understand if they truly are ranking them well. And slide 16, if you go to slide 16, here are the questions um, that comprise a job satisfaction index. And some are very general, as you pointed out, but it's still a place to start with. So you're not reaching all over everywhere to figure out what's making them leave. You can kind of start a focal point here in these questions. Can I just add one thing about job satisfaction in the federal sector? So the question has to be asked, where is this job satisfaction coming from, job dissatisfaction coming from? Is it, is it a high level? Are you unhappy being a federal employee? Is it because Congress is doing this? Is, and there, there is some things an agency has no control over. Is it the fact that you're in a department or an agency that you're unsatisfied with? So I'm going to transfer to another agency. Or is it your particular office and, and at the very, very local level where your job dissatisfaction is coming from, which can be fixed by moving to another office within the agency? So there are many places where job dissatisfaction is coming from. And if somebody in their career should ask themselves that question, because maybe you know the federal government as a federal government is not for you, or the department is not for you, or your local office is not so, for you. You know, but if, if I could just add. Actually. If I could just add one thing about this. When we look at the job satisfaction questions, when we think about this, how often does our supervisor or do your supervisors actually ask employees those questions? I mean, when you have conversations in, in your organization, the talking oftentimes revolves around the status of a task. It's not really about, you know, do you, t tell me, do you feel you know, Mike, tell me, do you feel you get personal satisfaction from your work? And let's talk about that. Those are not usually the conversations that are had. They're usually more about function. They're about task. They're about accomplishment. Or so that also but but can, we can begin can to turn this around a little bit. When, we can take these questions, and then we can have those conversations in our own little teams, in our organizations, so, to actually begin to bring the issues to light without seeing what happens in the annual EVS. absolutely within the direct supervisor's control. Mm -hmm. right. We cut the EVS far more granularly inside the agency. And when we get down to level three and below, so you know, level one is the assistant secretary, mm -hmm. level two is the heads of programs and so on and so forth. When we get down to the line supervisors and the, the smaller program heads, we see a 50 point swing in these indices. Uh, and that all, and, and that's within the same program, within the same chain of command. So much of this is driven by the line supervisor taking the time to sit down and have these conversations. Right. And, and we do have good supervisors who yeah. do that. We don't have enough good supervisors who and do that. And recruitment is so hard in the federal sector that you don't want to lose people. So the next question after that is, okay, your dissatisfaction, what's the, again, what's the delta? Mm -hmm. What can I do as your manager to improve your job satisfaction? It could be anything from more work, more substantial work, um, more time with family. It could be a work-life imbalance. But those are really, really critically important questions for supervisors to ask. And you right. know what the, the millennial employees who I've talked to, what they say the most important questions are is when their supervisor comes to and says, how can I help get you ready for your next job? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard for our managers to do right now for all of those reasons. But that's the kind of growth that they're looking for. So uh, Ian, we just have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to go to you quickly to see if there's one or two points you want to leave us with to the end, and then we'll see if there's one, maybe one question left for our panel. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think just starting off and just having um, kind of an open commodity discussion, 
what, how, how is your job? How, how am I doing um, helping you with your job? And what are some things that you don't like about your job? And then just, and just see where, where the conversation goes from there. And establishing that um, connection will allow uh, mm -hmm. supervisors to really understand their employees. And I know some large agencies have a lot of employees, so maybe a town hall meeting or something, but um, you gotta, you got to start with talking with them. That is, mm -hmm. that is the key takeaway I want to I talk about here. And another thing is this research needs to continue. I'd like to continue doing this research. I hope that this uh, spawns other types of research in this arena, and I'm happy to help anybody who wants to start this. But um, I think this is an issue that we need to really um, look at, and um, I'm, I'm curious to see where we go in the next few years. It's exciting. Absolutely, because soon we'll be seeing Generation Z coming into the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so these problems will, will continue until you know, we, we can solve it for a Y. Hopefully it can carry over into Z. And as John Oliver said in his piece about the IRS, a government agency should not have the same age, age ratio as an Eric Clapton concert. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, okay. Well, that was, that was, I think that's a perfect way to end. So, uh, I th actually, Ian, I think we could have talked for another hour at least on this. And, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come back with us again next year to uh, continue our conversation. So, uh, let me thank you very much, Ian, uh, for taking the time from your schedule to be with us. And, of course, thank I Thank you. And thank the panel, please. It was yes. very, very nice conversation. Yes, and I would thank like you. to thank the panel for being with us today, too. I appreciate it very much. So, and, of course, our Internet audience, thank you for being with us. So please join us again next month for the HUD OCIO Learning Session. Have a wonderful day.